I want to talk today about the design argument. Now, we might think that the design argument is long uh, dead and buried. Um, and if you read Hume um, in the uh, dialogues concerning natural religion, you might well come to the conclusion that his attack on the design argument, or what seems to be a very thoroughgoing critique thereof, is conclusive. Um, you might also think it's conclusive um, in terms of the old creation-based accounts of a design argument being largely done for by evolution. Uh, and I think, to a large extent, you'll, you'd be right. However, we've seen um, a resurgence in the design argument, not only in terms of those who would talk about intelligent um, design, um, but also generally from theology, and most importantly, I think, for people studying philosophy of religion, in F.R. Tennant's Philosophical Theology from 1930-ish. Um, and he's, he's writing after Hume's criticisms have had time to sink in. Ideas of evolution are widely accepted. So we often think, or people often claim, that his argument is more complex, more nuanced, more sophisticated, um, and therefore more worthy of our attention. You can look at it yourself and decide whether that's true. Um, I've got um, my doubts. Anyway, it's sometimes uh, put forward as if there are six key points, but I don't, don't intend um, going endlessly through them in rather tedious fashion one at a time, but to talk generally about them. They are generally to do with the idea of how does our relation to the world get accounted for by evolutionary necessity or selection, uh, or is there some aspect of human experience which is too rich, too fulsome, too um, complex or sophisticated to explain through the process of natural selection? So he talks about the fact that the world is more or less intelligible to us, that we can understand the world um, more than we need. Yes, we can make prediction-based things. We can work out how to open things, how to make things differently so that there's more food. We can learn how to do this. But doesn't our logical understanding exceed what is needed for survival? And it's this idea of an excess that's quite common in a lot of more contemporary versions of the design argument, the idea that the evolutionary necessity required for us, or what evolution would select for in a species like us, doesn't fully explain the richness of human consciousness, and we see also um, moral and aesthetic aspects, um, the fact that I can, I can find something so beautiful that I cry, apparently. Um, and that doesn't seem to be selected for at all, it'll be explained in this version of it. So there needs something beyond biological need to explain it, suggesting it beyond, therefore that being seen as being a prop for theism. So we we get that aspect. We get a whole bunch of different ways in which there seems to be a biological excess. Also you see in tenant and generally in contemporary theological uh, arguments a shift to accommodate Darwinian evolution, an attempt to shift a concentration on um, evolution being taken into account, I guess. I guess you could call it this. The teleologist, can't say that at all. The teleologist, the person interested in the design argument, you can say it yourself. Um, the person proposing the design argument shifts from special design in the product of the process, us, the world around us, to special design or directivity in the process itself. Now that might sound like gobbledygook, especially as I started out not being able to say key words, but I'll repeat it because it's kind of really important, I think. The teleologist, um, the design argument proponent, shifts their concern from saying, Things appear to be designed. Remember the watch, remember Paley? So shifts um, from saying, look, the watch is designed, the human eye is designed, the, the, the bug is designed in your hand, whatever it might be, 
to rather say, look at the process of evolution. Isn't it amazing? Isn't it subtle? Isn't it so clever, so sophisticated, that actually the process itself is where we see evidence of directivity, evidence of design, evidence of intention, evidence of there being a goal in mind, very teleological. Um, so doesn't this idea of the survival of the fittest presuppose or be directed at the arrival of the fit? That would be us. Um, so does the process itself of evolution not appear designed, rather than the products of evolution? So that's a big shift for the um, design argument, but one you encounter um, in modern versions of it, that there's a big shift from being the product that's designed to the process that produces the product being purpose-driven, intent-driven, and things of this sort. Um, one of the other things you often encounter, and I briefly want to cover, um, because I think it's important, um, is the idea that it's incredibly unlikely that we would ever exist. The fitness our world has to produce and sustain life. Um, such a huge number of conditions, unique conditions, need to come together to allow life. The odds against life are staggering. You know, we could have been wiped out, human life, all life, evolving life over huge time spans could have been wiped out at all sorts of points in our um, history and might be, of course, particularly if we carry on with our own self-destructive urges, not happen yet. So is it actually really, really unlikely that life would just happen like that and not be wiped out by there not quite being enough oxygen, there not quite being enough thickness in the ozone layer, there not quite being um, an avoidance of loads of meteorites for the longest period of time to allow the evolutionary process? Isn't the theistic explanation that God lent a hand to this process, was involved in this process, more probable than less probable? What Tennant writes about this, and I'm quoting now, which I'll try and avoid doing, normally quoting anybody, but he says, presumably the world is comparable with a single throw of dice, and common sense is not foolish in suspecting the dice to have been loaded. He writes that in Philosophical Theology. Um, so he says, if you are to equate human life to rolling a thousand dice and getting six on all of them, actually the, the odds against human life occurring might be even greater, but say, let's say, say a thousand dice, rolling them all and getting six on all of them, that does seem unlikely. It does seem improbable. You might think, yeah, the chances of there being human life here do seem um, very stacked against us. Um, and if you were to roll dice a thousand times um, and then have them uh, all come on six, that would be unlikely. They sh surely they must have been loaded. What Tent ignores here, and I'm sure some people listening have got this already, is some basic facts about probability. There is not only one planet in the solar system, in the universe. There are millions of planets. So you could say all the planets where life fails to exist as on Mars. So the dice were rolled, but, as far as we currently know, they didn't all land on six. So the world isn't comparable with a single throw of the dice. Each planet represents, for example, a throw of the dice. So if you roll those dice a million times, out of the million times you roll them, the chances of them all coming up in the same result suddenly change quite a lot. So you could say it is not feasible to say this world is comparable with a single throw of dice. This is a this must have been the lucky one. So this idea that dice must have been loaded seems very centred on this world. It doesn't seem to think well every world will be, will have been a throw of the dice, and on the on the Mars, so on Mars, on Jupiter, on Neptune, on Pluto, on loads of other planets we can see where there isn't life, the dice didn't come up in all six, something didn't happen. But here, one small uh, planet, we were lucky enough to have those. There may well be other planets out there where there has been, or will be, or maybe currently is life as well. But the idea that just because something's unlikely means um, it must have been helped, seems to not really take into account the facts of uh, the universe and the facts of probability. Um, 
and I think that's a weak argument when you look at it. The one that really seems to get people going, though, and this is one I mentioned previously, is the idea that the experience we have exceeds our evolutionary probability. The world is a bearer of values, humanity's moral nature. Now, of course, there are perfectly um, long-standing explanations of those within um, things like evolutionary psychology, let's say, um, that uh, our moral nature has an evolutionary basis. It's to do with the fact that we need to be able to um, trust each other in order to thrive. People who trust each other, people who are able to work out ways to band together, survive better and things. So there are evolutionary explanations that compete quite healthily with um, theological explanations. And there are other explanations that are have an evolutionary payoff, I guess, but don't aren't evolutionary psychology in the way we understand it. And they will say, these may be side effects of evolution. They haven't been positively selected for, they are accident, accidental results of other factors. So we have big brains that are very, very good at social things because of other factors to do with trust and to do with the social nature of apes and humans. Uh, and some of the side effects of that, which aren't negative in terms of uh, selection, are to do with appreciation and art and things, and they don't have a negative effect and therefore haven't been selected against uh, and happen to coexist with factors that are selected for. Uh, however, just to finish off, uh, some people argue that if we take all these things together, the idea of uh, the world being unlikely the whole life, but it does. The idea of us not needing to appreciate our morality um, to kind of make sense of the world in a philosophical way, but we do. Um, the fact that we appreciate nature, and we don't need to, but we do appreciate it and sit and look at a beautiful sunset or whatever. Uh, these all taken together um, make the design argument suddenly much more attractive. Um, that bears some weight if you say it quickly, but I think if you take each condition or each aspect of it bit by bit by bit and unpick them, this idea that cumulatively they have a kind of directive force which is more persuasive um, starts, I think, very, very quickly to disintegrate uh, and ultimately fall apart. I've said elsewhere in a separate video why I think all proofs that the, the uh, existence of God actually misunderstand what religion is about anyway uh, and why faith is. Um, in conflict with the idea of proving the existence of God anyway. But I think we, these arguments are so widely encountered and heard that we need to actually, as it were, get involved with them and try and disentangle whether or not they make any kind of persuasive sense at all. Thank you.